My name is Margaret Busby. I have been involved with literature in one way or another for many decades. I was a publisher. I know that they're going to say on my obituary she was the UK's youngest and first black woman publisher. That's true. Mm -hmm. But I haven't been a publisher for many years. I, I've been freelancing as an editor, writer, broadcaster, lots of different things. And most recently I edited an anthology called New Daughters of Africa, which was published in 2019 by Myriad Editions. You mentioned that in your obituary, hopefully <laughs> one will take a while until it comes out, and they will mention that you were the first black and female, and the youngest as well, right? At the time I was the youngest, yes. I mean, no, not anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the youngest and first UK black female publisher. And ever since you started out as a publisher, and you're not publishing anymore, but ever since then, looking at the publishing industry and looking at who has and in publishing, who, who are the gatekeepers? How do you feel about how things are looking now? How far we have come or not, if anything has changed? I, I suppose it's inevitable that one has to admit that things have changed a little, but I think there's still a need in the publishing industry as a whole for there to be a different uh, way of including a range of voices, because it's still doesn't bring everybody into the industry in the way it should. Mm -hmm. And until that happens, we, we won't be talking about it when it's happened. We won't need to talk about it. It'll be just normal. You know, that, that's the way society is. You walk down the street, you see people of all sorts of uh, ethnicities, ages, you know, classes, gen you know, that's the way the world is. Mm -hmm. And particularly a, a capital like London. So. You don't want to go into a room and see everybody the same age, looking exactly the same. You want to see the range of people who you know, make life interesting, who make the city interesting. Mm -hmm. um, your first anthology came out in 92, right? The year I was born. Just don't my, say just that! <laughs> Which is not, well, it's kind of long ago, but yeah, it's, it's, quite, it's quite a while ago, I'm still young. 1992 is quite yeah, a while ago. And yeah. now recently the second iteration of um, that anthology called New Daughters of Africa mm -hmm. um, has come out. Um, a lot has happened since then. The world has changed, like you mentioned. Um, how has the setup or the makeup of the anthologies changed or has it stayed the same in a way? Um, what kind of authors have you tried to add? Have some been left out? What, what has happened to the anthology? In comp like, how do they compare to each other? Daughters of Africa and New Daughters of Africa are part of the same canon. I suppose you could call it the canon of literature creativity by women of African descent. and. It's not been exhausted yet. I could do another anthology tomorrow, the same size or bigger. And I deliberately didn't want New Daughters to be simply millennials, writers who are currently writing. I wanted to have that historical perspective. So it begins with a Nigerian woman who was born in 1793. So to show that there is that historical dimension to the creativity of women of African descent, that everybody is part of that chain, People are influenced by each other. People have been, you know, reading each other. People in the first volume influence people in the second volume. People in the first volume have descendants in the second volume. I mean, for example, in the first vol volume, there was somebody called Mabel Dove, Mabel Dove Dankwa. In this volume is her niece called uh, Nardov. In the first volume, Daughters of Africa, there was Alice Walker. In New Daughters of Africa, there's Rebecca Walker. But also, in New, da in New Daughters of Africa, there are writers who are of different generations, but who influence each other. Zadie Smith is in New Daughters. Zadie Smith's mother is in New Daughters, Al Yvonne Bailey Smith. So there are all sorts of ways in which the writers, the contributors to the volume have impacted on each other and impact on the world. I mean, some are better known than others, but that doesn't mean to say that there are writers who deserve to be better known than they are. So I wanted to say 
look at all these talented creative people and if you haven't heard of them that's not their fault mm -hmm. read up and enjoy what was the impulse what impulse made you want to put together the first anthology and this and also the second anthology and is there a reason why you chose 2019 um, as a year to bring out the second anthology or was it coincidental was there a meaning behind uh, the time the the first volume daughters of africa i wanted to compile it because i wanted to read it for a start but i think also in that era it, there was more of a feeling that the wider literature industry didn't acknowledge that there were so many women of African descent who were creative and writing and needed to be given attention. So you'd know half a dozen or fewer. You'd know of Alice Walker or Toni Morrison or Maya Angelou. And I had them in, New da in Daughters of Africa. But I wanted to show that there were writers who went before them, writers who were contemporaries of theirs. I had a big, big bibliographical section in Daughters of Africa to show that it wasn't just those writers within the anthology that were important, but there, there was, it was a starting point. You could leap off from there and, and find, discover on your own so many important and, and nourishing writers. So that was the rationale behind Daughters of Africa. And also in that era, somehow, somehow you would find that women were just being excluded. You find an anthology that might say it was an anthology of short stories from the West Indies. It wouldn't say by men, but there were enough women in it, or poetry from Africa. Not necessarily claiming to be by men, but somehow there was an absence of women. So I was trying to remedy those absences, and that was what happened uh, with the first volume. And to a certain extent, there's still a need for that. So when Candida Lacey, who was actually the commissioning editor for Daughters of Africa, when she started, she was publishing with a, a feminist company called Pandora Press, and she commissioned me to do Daughters of Africa then, and then she moved on to uh, another company and eventually to Jonathan Cape, and I went with her. So the book came out from Jonathan Cape in 1992, and it went out of print over the years, as, as a lot of good books do, and it's sometimes because editors come and go, and, and they don't the books they've taken on get, don't get championed within publishing companies. So Dorsets of Africa was long out of print and we were trying to find a way of bringing it back into print that would make economic sense because it was a, you know, over a thousand pages long, you know, the permissions fees you had to pay to publishers and agents amounted to you know, 10,000 pounds or more. And it wasn't a, a way we could um, see that we could reprint that, but we thought we could do another volume called New Daughters. It wouldn't repeat the first volume would have a completely different contributors and again more than 200 going back over the centuries as well as in the, the, the present day but we also wanted to make sure it had some sort of a, an ongoing legacy so there was a sort of charitable charitable aspect to it as well we explored different ways we might do this eventually what has come about because of the way we went, went ahead to do it is that there's a collaboration between Myriad Editions, the publishers, and SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies, London, London University, which means that because all the contributors waived their fees in a very generous way, no, none of the contributors got paid to be in this anthology. And so we were able to make a collective donation. SOAS also had a crowdfunding site. And because of this anthology, uh, woman student from Africa who wants to do a, a particular course of study at SOAS will get a free course and free accommodation because of everybody having waived their fees. So that is, and, and with, with, with any inspiration and luck, that will continue because people will donate. So that will be an ongoing award. It's actually named the Margaret Busby New Daughters of Africa Award, which is part of SOAS's scholarship scheme. But, you know, with, with the point of doing it was so that there was some sort of continuum. We're, we're con keeping that creative spirit and that, that air of sisterhood going because 
they didn't need to do that. And, and there are many writers who are not in here, not because they didn't deserve to be, and sometimes people wanted to be in it, sometimes people missed a deadline, sometimes there were all sorts of reasons people that you might think, oh, why aren't so-and-so in there? There are all sorts of logistical reasons why they, they, they're not in there, but not because they don't deserve to be. So, you know, it's, it's, it's not an exclusive volume. It's a volume showing here are some 200 mostly living mm -hmm. women writers who you should know more about, who deserve a spotlight shone on them. Some of them you will know, whether it's Chimamanda or Zadie, others you may not know, but maybe you should know. So it was trying to fulfill that function as well as have a, an ongoing legacy for, for future African women, trying to say, well, here are some who haven't had the breaks, perhaps, or haven't been given the opportunities, who are not as lucky as some of the others in terms of having attention given to them that they deserve. So that was, that was the rationale. And the, the, the date was not chosen specifically. We started in probably in about mid-2017, thinking about, yes, we can do this. And in the next year, I must have written you know, thousands of emails to people suggesting the idea, they'd send me pieces, I'd edit the pieces, and it probably took um, no more than, uh, at the most, uh, 18 months to put together. And it was published last year, a year ago, International Women's Day actually. And so, so it's it, almost a year old now. Too. Exactly. And, and the sad thing is that in that year, two of the contributors have died, Andrea Levy mm -hmm. and Guyanese writer called Andai. So there are writers who uh, are from a historical perspective, writers who have left us like Andai and Andrea. But there are so many writers who are still with us, still creating, still being inspired by each other, being inspired by the first volume. And in the first volume, there are writers who are not well known, who aren't well known now. Jackie Kay, who's the, the Scottish poet laureate now, was just starting out and she was in the first volume. So there is, it's a sort of ongoing process and writers are inspiring each other, being, feeling strengthened by each other and continuing to create some marvellous work in, in, in every genre you can think of, in, in every country. And not every country, of course, in the world is represented, but you know, every country could be to a certain extent. And the languages, some things are translated from European languages or African languages, but there are so many other things that could have made other volumes. So this is not the end of the story. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is the next stage in the story. So we've got Daughters of Africa, we've got New Daughters of Africa, and something else will come after it. We'll be eagerly awaiting what comes after it. <laughs> well, just enjoy the one that you've yes. got so far. So New Daughters of Africa is the yeah. one that currently you'll yeah. find easy to find, yeah. because Daughters of Africa, as I said, unfortunately, is not in print anymore. But you can sometimes find second-hand copies. But yeah. New Daughters of Africa, will keep you busy for yes. quite a while. <laughs> yes, and, and the, um, the, I don't like the word, but the diversity of women inside mm. um, the anthology is just astonishing. And there are so many I don't know. And I'm like, oh, that, that, That's you know, a great this? surprise for you. You yes. find people that you don't know. Mm. Um, not, it's not your fault, it's yeah. because sometimes people have you not... You can't read everything. Yeah, no, no, well, you can't read everything. And, and sometimes people have just not been given the attention they deserve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the re review coverage, they, they haven't been you know, in the national newspapers or yes. the, on the radio or television, yeah. but yet they're writing things that, um, you know, we can all connect with. And sometimes writers are starting out, other writers have been trying for many a year and uh, are struggling. So it's a variety of, of, of contributor as well as of subject matter and genre. and. You know, age groups are different. There are some very some writers born in the 1990s, mm -hmm. as well as a writer born in the 1790s. So we're it showing that there is that historical sweep, and it's ongoing. Mm -hmm. It shows that African women writers have been around for a long time, not for just time. since the 60s. Or exactly, or it's it's not a new phenomenon. Ph phenomenon. Yeah. I can't say that word. Can I? <laughs> phenomenon. <laughs> you know what I mean. Yeah. It's not a new thing. Mm. Well, a number of women um, have said that 
and have been quite vocal about the influence you have had um, on their lives and on their careers and the inspiration you have been to them. We just had an example uh, just an hour earlier in the oh. form of Sarah, right? She, um, she was very. She had so much praise for you, and it. I could see that she was really empowered and inspired by you. And um, there are others. There are lots of women out there like yourself who help other women out. Mm. And um, since you will not be here forever, unfortunately, <laughs> how important do you think it is for women to continue to empower each other? especially uh, women of African descent and what would be what what are some ways that you would like to see um, people take to continue to leave a legacy and empower others and you know hand open the door yes mm. but keep it open for others to come through. I, I think everybody can be an inspiration to somebody mm -hmm. and if you're doing something in the best possible way you can do it, you may well inspire somebody else. And there, there, are, there are two sayings I, I live my life by, mm -hmm. more or less. I mean, there are more mm -hmm. than that, but one is plant trees under which you will never sit. And the other one, which is an adaptation of a, a, a quotation from an American president, Truman, it's amazing what you can accomplish when you don't care who takes the credit. So you're not doing things so that somebody will say, oh, look at her, how clever she is. You're doing things so that you're making things happen, you're, you're helping other people, you're showing other people what's possible. And if they're inspired by you, that, that's, that's wonderful. That, that's all I can ask for. I, I, I'm not doing something in order that I'm going to get paid for it necessarily or get uh, acknowledged for it. I'm doing it because I know it needs to be done. I mean, you, everybody knows things that need to be done. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to wait for somebody to say, well, if you do it, I'm going to reward you. You do it because you believe it. Because you're, if you're a good person, you do it because it's something you believe in. And it will have its benefits, and somebody will reap those benefits. I mean, I am here not because I'm some sort of genius, because I'm here because of the sacrifices made by my parents, and their parents, and other people that they interacted with. And so it's not that any one of us is doing something in isolation. We're all doing things that can empower each other, either intergenerationally or in terms of who you meet, who you see doing things that are inspirational. And that, that's, that's what we can hope for, that we're going to leave this world in a better way than we found it, if you like, in however small a contribution we can make, we have to try and make it.